morning, everyone. I'd like to start this morning by acknowledging that the land we stand on is the traditional, un traditional unceded territory of the Abenaki people, who have had a continual and enduring presence here since time immemorial. We offer respect to their ancestors, their elders, and their relations, past, present, and emerging. We recognize and wish to honor this responsibility that accompanies the acknowledgement of these relationships. My name is Susan Evans McClure, and I'm the Executive Director of the Vermont Arts Council. Welcome to the 2024 Vac Darn Day of Learning. Nice, thanks everyone. <clears throat> so in the spirit of modeling good disaster planning, the emergency exits are uh, to this building are located back there in the entrance that you came in and over here to my left, your right, um, over by the other opposite side of the kitchen. And in case of evacuation, our emergency um, meetup point is the Elks Lodge parking lot right between behind this building. So VACDARN, of course, is the world's best acronym and also stands for the Vermont Arts and Culture Disaster and Resilience Network. VACDARN was formed in 2019 and is a true network of networks. A diverse steering team comes together to enable artists, creative workers, and cultural organizations to build their skills in emergency preparedness, mobilize response for mutual assistance, and engage collectively with first responders and government emergency management agencies. So thank you very much to the VACDARN, VACDARN steering team for your leadership. And if you are on the VACDARN steering team, if you could stand up right now, so we can acknowledge you. Yeah, there you go. <clears throat> and thank you especially to the co-leads of VACDARN, Amy Cunningham, Deputy Director of the Vermont Arts Council, and Rachel Onuf, Director of the Vermont, sorry about this, what's happening? Uh, Rachel Onuf, Director of the Vermont Historic Records Program in the Vermont Secretary of State's office. And thank you both for not, well, yes. Oh. oh. Well, yes, I'm, I think it's the angle. I'm gonna do this. Um, <laughs> so thank you both to Amy and Rachel, not only for leading the planning of today's event, but for your vision and commitment to both translating the complexity of emergency management and emergency response to the cultural sector and for building our capacity to prepare for whatever lies ahead. And if there's anything we've learned in the past few years, it's that disaster resiliency is about relationships and that we need those relationships far before the crisis strikes. So take a moment to look around this room. This is your network. Today you'll be learning from speakers and panels, but also connecting with each other. Our line of work is hard and it's only become harder as we've been struck by crisis after crisis. Today's event was supposed to be a chance to look back after more than a full year after 2023's flooding. But instead, we're continuing to respond to an often interconnected series of crises. Today is a moment to pause during what can feel like nonstop chaos, to take a breath, to learn together, and to lean on each other. The poet Amanda Gorman wrote, Lost as we feel, there is no better compass than compassion. The crises are going to happen, but we can build our muscles to respond and support each other to do so with compassion, care, and learning. Thank you all so much for being here today, for taking time to prepare and to learn and to grow your network. And now I'm pleased to introduce Deputy Secretary of State, Lauren Hibbert. Lauren. You might wanna just like hold. Yeah, I'll follow your lead. Here we are being adaptive already with the microphone. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and the Secretary of State, Secretary Copeland Hansis, does send her regrets. She's speaking uh, down at Castleton this afternoon. And as you know, we have a very long state. You can't be in two places at the same time if you have to be there on the same day. Um, the Vermont Secretary of State's office is so proud of our partnership with the Vermont Arts Council and the VACDARN program. As um, was just mentioned, this program is five years old and is part of the broader Allow Alliance for Response Network. We are broader than many other networks and I think that's represented here in the room today and something we all should be really proud of. It incorporates artists and arts organizations as well as collecting institutions and we are really grateful um, for those partnerships. 
And Vakdarn is really a great story about committed people working together before the need is completely clear. And this group has risen to the challenge um, and multiple times, COVID-19, and then the flooding in 23, and then the flooding in 24. In response to the flood in 23 alone, Vakdarn deployed five times with the help of friends, colleagues, and the steering team members. The team triaged and salvaged items at the Montpelier City Hall, a Catholic church, a corporate archive, the Vermont Studio Center, and the Justin Morrill Homestead, a, a state historic site. Again, the Secretary of State, you know, we have many programs within our, um, within our umbrella. We have elections and businesses and um, occupational licenses. Um, a lot of those other programs get a lot of attention. Um, but our records program, our commitment to VAC Darn remains very steady and true because we truly believe that access to historical records, um, artistic artifacts and important things, um, uh, government records is really foundational to democracy. And I just wanna say that everyone in this room is doing the work of democracy. It's really through um, the arts that democracy can flourish, so thank you. Um, and um, so we're just extremely proud. So vital work. Sorry, I went on a tangent. I went off, off script because I'm so proud of all of you. Um, so it, when, but when uh, disasters and emergencies strike, there are so many competing priorities. Um, and it's really important that VACDARN exists so that the priorities of records and preservation are in the list of priorities um, and that we have the experts necessary to provide the, resport, the support. So I just wanna um, say how proud we are of Rachel Onoff. She's in the room there in the back. Um, she's such a great representative of our office um, in this network. So thank you, Rachel. And um, with that, I'd like to introduce Harold Stewart, the Executive Director of the New England Foundation of the Arts. And, and this thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I'm, uh, in addition to being the executive director of the New England Foundation for the Arts, I'm a theater practitioner, so silence doesn't serve me well. Good morning. Good. Um, it is indeed a privilege and an honor to be here again um, in Vermont and to be welcomed amongst this creative community and our peers. Uh, I come, you know, and many of you are familiar with the uh, New England Foundation for the Arts, um, lovingly known as NIFA, um, as a grant maker um, and an arts and cultural service organization through our culture policy work and our creative economy work. But I would also offer in this moment as NIFA, similar to the Vermont Arts Council, is in a strategic planning uh, position, but we're also a learning organization. So it's important for me to be here um, as the executive director, but also a student at this important day of learning. Um, I would also say, you know, in that vein, uh, if you've done strategic planning and Amy, you know, and the team at Vermont Arts Council, my heart is with you because we're in the midst of it. Adaptability is something that we have to be mindful of, right? Um, adaptability and service of our vision. And so I see a lot of that already in the room and in the work. So it's a good time for NIFA to be here as we're thinking about vision and thinking about adaptability. Um, we are mindful and we know that the greatest teacher of uh, adaptation is our natural environment. So again, I am excited to be here uh, to learn and to grow with you um, in this moment. And since I'm bringing that spirit, in addition to this welcome, I, all, I ask that we all just hold you know, those notions that we can be adaptable, we can serve um, in the service of a larger vision. There is a role for arts and culture, and that's what we're called to do. So again, uh, welcome. Um, it would be great to meet as many of you as I can as I'm here throughout the day, so please don't hesitate to come and say hi in the session or at a break. And now, again, it is my honor to bring to the stage um, Tiger Christie.
Hi, everyone. I'm Tyga Christie. I work with Vermont Emergency Management and also co-direct Faultline Ensemble. And I am honored to be introducing Anna Glover, our keynote speaker today. Anna comes to us from the David Geffen School of Drama at Yale and from years of really unique experience in occupational and safety in the arts. I'm thrilled to have them here. Um, when I first met Anna in a training session several years ago, they said something like, I like doing dangerous things safely, and I was immediately sold. Um, their work, they're a national leader in teaching artists to approach risk and safety from a place of opportunity rather than limitation and regulation. And their work seeks to say yes to ambitious projects and to find ways to take impressive artistic risks without sacrificing care for people making the work happen, which I think everyone in this room can appreciate. Anna's past work includes London's National Theater, South Bank Center, New York's Lyric Theater, and Yale Repertory Theater, among many others. And I'm really grateful to have them here today to kick off a day of conversation about care, resilience, risk, adaptation, and healing through the arts. So please help me welcome Anna. Thank you so much. Just give me a second to get set up. And let me know if I need to press something on the uh, projector. Seems to be okay. Excellent, thank you. It's just warming up like many of us today. Um, I'm thrilled to be here today as part of this uh, really wonderful and important day. And I'm thrilled to have been asked to do this speech. Um, and I've given it the title, Beautiful Uncertainty, How to Live and Thrive with Risk. Um, where am I coming from? Well, thank you, Tiger, for that lovely introduction. Yes, Anna Glover, they them pronouns, the Director of uh, Theatre Safety and Occupational Health at the David Geffen School of Drama at Yale and the Yale Repertory Theatre. Now, some of you may never have worked with a safety director before. So what do I do? Well, I sort of translate the health and safety policies and codes of OSHA into things that the entertainment industry can work with. Um, and I try to you know, make companies make informed decisions and also perhaps make safety almost a little less boring. But in practice, what that means is I am <clears throat> the health and safety and occupational health specialist, an HR manager, a finance director, a counselor, a risk manager, a teacher, a trainer, an operations director, an emergency management coordinator, an accessibility consultant, a decision sign coach, and a negotiation specialist. An all in all safety unicorn. And as I look around the room, I'm betting every single one of you is also wearing all of those hats. Because when you work in the wonderful world of events and performing arts, and you're responsible for the safety and resilience of all of those people, there will be times when in each moment of the day, you may be required to switch out all of those different hats. So I know I'm speaking to the right crowd today. But why uncertainty and what the heck's so beautiful about it? Well, I'm a safety director and I'm not hardwired to love uncertainty. In fact, I spend my days looking ahead, planning different events, seeing how, as Tiger said, I can help people get to yes and try to mitigate against any of the risks that come. So uncertainty isn't something that I'm really comfortable with. But in 2016, I was suddenly faced with a whole ton of uncertainty. My wonderful wife, Raquel, and I decided we were going to move country. And this slide shows everything we own wrapped up in black plastic, getting ready to make the six week journey across the Atlantic to the United States. By the way, I'm so thrilled this conference is in Vermont because of all the places I've visited. I think Vermont is just one of the most stunning and we always come here for holidays. So thrilled to be here today. Um, <clears throat> so here we are shipping all of our stuff. Now, when you move country, I don't know if anyone has ever done this, but they give you a three month window from when they tell you you can move to when you actually can move. And you don't exactly know if they're going to say yes or no. So it's really hard to plan anything. You can't accept a job. You can't necessarily book a house because they might say, sorry. And then you have to start the whole process again. If you don't move within that three month process, you also have to start the whole process again. So a lot of uncertainty. At the same time, the United Kingdom decided it was going to vote whether or not to remain as part of the European Union. So we had Brexit. So there I am walking the streets of London with a ton of uncertainty on my shoulders, wondering what I could do about it. 
And I started listening to podcasts at that time. And I came across a podcast that a friend of mine had done, um, now called the uh, Decision Making Studio Podcast. And he offered that there were actually six things that you could do to lessen the effect of uncertainty. And this was revolutionary for me. So I'm gonna offer those six same things to you today with the same offering that I gave myself in that moment. I'm gonna give you some suggestions, but I urge you to make them an experiment of your own life and actually try them out because I've tried them and they work for me. But with any advice, always remember, it has to work for you in the moment. Let me just make a few caveats before I go any further. I'm not talking about uncertainty of where you're gonna to sleep tonight or what food you're gonna have next. That kind of uncertainty is life-threatening. And I think that's a whole other range of discussions and, and things that we need to build in for that. So the uncertainty that I'm talking about today is very much to do with events and other things. If your life is threatened, that's not what this discussion is about. What is uncertainty though? We need to start with a working definition of anything that we're gonna work on. So uncertainty here, I offer something that the University of Michigan came up with as what I think is quite a brilliant version of what it is. It is the result of having limited knowledge about an event or an occurrence, right? So we don't know what it is that we're going to get into because we haven't ever done anything like this before. And here we have an artist's rendition of Shackleton's uh, offering to those who wanted to go with him to the Antarctic. Men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter, cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. So here is the original advert for uncertainty. I can tell you that you're gonna be cold. I can tell you that you're not gonna get paid very much. And I can tell you that you're gonna be in constant danger, but what I can't tell you is whether you're gonna come back and talk about it afterwards. And for those of you who haven't yet read the account of how they all work together to stay safe, I think it's, it's, it's a brilliant example of what, it, what, it, what happens when a group of people decide collectively that they are going to change the face of an outcome. So uncertainty is our inability to look ahead and reason back. Now, uh, Nick Dixit and Nell Bluff wrote a brilliant book on strategic thinking, and this is basically what they say you need to win any game of chess, the ability to look ahead and reason back. But uncertainty is our inability to do that because we have no data on the past that will help us imagine what is going to happen in the future. Um, that is one of the problems with AI. I'm a big fan of AI. I'm trying to work out how to bring it into my practice. But what artificial intelligence is doing is looking at all of the data of the past in order to give us suggestions of what is going to happen in the future. But it can't create or imagine for us. And so whilst I urge you to kind of look into building some of this work into your practice, remember that also AI can't cope with uncertainty either. It is still not a magic eight ball. So our quest is to explore the unknown unknowns. Now, there's this myth that in the old days, in medieval times, when they were making maps, if they didn't know what something was or what something was going to happen, they would put a big dragon there and say, here be dragons. Well, sadly, the reality isn't quite as romantic. There's only about three times that that has happened, and some of those images are up here. But I like to think of that as early medieval scenario plan. We don't exactly know what's gonna happen, but if we imagine something in the future, we can then plan for it. Because a plan might be useless, but planning is invaluable. And working together to decide on a response to something, you can then start to activate your group. So maybe I don't know what is gonna happen, but if I imagine dragons, well, then I'm gonna need a lookout to see what happens when the dragons are coming. And we're gonna need buckets of water because we know that dragons can catch fire to something. And maybe we'll need an artist to capture some of the renditions to put on the mat. You get the drift, right? You can start to plan when you have an idea of what you're looking forward to. So here be dragons. Now let's look at what uncertainty isn't. If we plot knowledge of probability on the ground axis, and if we plot clarity objectives on the y-axis, we can come up with this pretty useful quadrant. Now with any quadrant, of course, there's a story to be told, right? This isn't the be all and end all, but I think it's a useful framing. If you know what your event 
or your, your piece of theater, what it is you're trying to achieve, if you have clarity of objectives, then you are already winning if you know exactly what that event is going to be. If you don't exactly know the probability of the things that are going to happen either to that event or during that event, then you have uncertainty. So we're going to have this event, but we don't know if it's going to snow or if it's going to rain or what's going to happen. We're in uncertainty. Now, if we know exactly what's going to happen in the, uh, in, in, with, to do with the weather, but we have zero idea of what the event is going to be like, then we're in ambiguity. And if you feel that you are in ambiguity at any point in your work, just ask yourself, do I have clarity of objectives? Clarity of objectives, not just for the event, but perhaps personally what you are trying to achieve with the work that you're doing. Is it, I want to put this artist in front of this group of people? Is it that I want people to have a good time? Is it that I'm trying to change hearts and minds? I think what I love about Tiger's work is they do both with that, right? The, the artists, the, the organizations are involved in the work and they can also change the hearts and minds. So as an audience member, I feel that their work has a real clarity of objectives. Now, if you have high clarity of objectives and you know the probability of what is going to happen, but you just don't know if it's going to, then you're in the risk category. Now, quite frankly, if you're in the bottom left and you don't know what you're doing and you don't know what's going to happen, then you're in ignorance and quite frankly, you shouldn't be doing events. There are tons of definitions of risk. Risk is an incredibly broad church, but actually I love talking about it because safety is such a binary term and it's really hard to have a conversation about what you want to achieve if you're using binary terms. Yes and is much more valuable. So let's imagine, as has happened to me in my career, someone comes up to me and says, we'd like a troop of fire jugglers to be outside your, your event, and we would like them to do a fire juggling routine. I love fire juggling. And I was like, well, I'm not going to tell you that's safe, right? The unsa it's ne there's no way in the world that fire juggling is safe. But if we change the word to risk, we can start to look at that sliding scale. And then I can have a conversation with the artist. How do we make this less risky? Well, first of all, the artists need to be trained to know what they do. Have I seen their work before or are they just people having a go? Then when you are doing fire juggling, you need to, if you're using poi as an example, you dip the poi in your fuel and you whirl it around a few times before you set fire to it so that when you set fire to it, you don't get flames shooting off. Yeah, I've had a go at it, it's really good fun. <laughs> then you have a safe zone so that the audience can't come too close. And then you also have a first aider on standby. And now we're starting to reduce that risk. So we're not having a safe event, but we're having a risk, uh, a risk less, a lesser of a risk event. So I think it's a much easier conversation. Now, there are lots of definitions of risk, and we often think about risk just in terms of financial. But actually, I think it's useful in the events industry hugely. We could see it as the combination of an event occurring and the likelihood. We could see it as just damage or injury to property. But this last one, the effect of uncertainty on you know, business objectives or your objectives, I think, is where risk is. Now, you're going to say to me, hang on, Anna, in the last slide, didn't you tell me that there was a line between risk and uncertainty? Yes, but in the middle ground, that's sometimes where we are, between risk and uncertainty. When we have clarity of objectives, we have some probability of knowledge of an event, then we're in that area of risk and uncertainty, and actually that's the most exciting place to be. The trouble is, like many of us, I know, I am hardwired to love certainty. And it's been proven. Now, it's a small study, and I would say with any study, you know, you need to repeat it several times to make sure, but I think this is fascinating. So in 2016, at the same time that I was moving country and that we were leaving the European Union in the UK, 45 brave souls went to the University of London to take part in an experiment. And what they did as part of this experiment is they put you in front of a computer screen on which was a rock. And if you turn that rock over by pressing a button and there was nothing under that rock, nothing happened to you. But if you turn that rock, press the button and turn the rock over and there was a snake under it, you got an electric shock. I can't imagine why anyone signed up to this study, but 45 people did. The fascinating thing was 
that people were being measured for their stress levels whilst this was going on. And the people, okay, so there was a group of people who turned the rock over. Let's imagine this half of the room. You turn the rock over and every time nothing happens to you, your stress levels start to go down. This half of the room, you're really unlucky. Every time you press the button and turn the rock over, you see a snake and you get a shock. The middle of the room are kind of in between the two. You are all pressing the button and you don't know 50% of the time it's gonna be nothing and 50% it's the snake. You end up being far more stressed than the people who definitely know they're gonna get a shock, which I think is kind of mind blowing. So this group, far happier knowing that everything is fine than not knowing. So uncertainty gives us a stress response. But what we're gonna find is that actually we can, do, we can make that useful to us. To start with, we need a compass and not a map when we're, when we're dealing with uncertainty. Coming back to the clarity of objectives. When I moved country, I didn't know what job I was gonna have. I didn't know I was gonna be lucky enough to get this, the, the job at, at Yale that I have now. It wasn't actually available at the time. I wasn't moving for a job. But I knew that I was passionate about communicating safety in performing arts, and that I wanted to have the same conversations over here as I was having over in the United Kingdom. And so I started to kind of build up that work and just pointed the ship in that direction, knowing what my north was gonna look like. So whenever you're faced with any time of uncertainty, having that conversation, do I know where my true north is, will help you even if you don't exactly know what the train is gonna look like when you get there. Because when you face a barrier or an obstacle, you know if you're gonna go around it where you're gonna end up focused to, as opposed to, I don't know where I'm going and I've no idea what happens if this hits. So here are the six things and then we're gonna talk about them. One, reduce debt reliance on things, reduce leverage. And I know some of you are gonna take pictures and notes, that's fine. I'm also gonna make the slides available and all the links I talk about, I'll make sure that we try and get to you all afterwards. So, but please feel free to take any pictures you want. So reduce debt reliance on things. Two, build community. Now these aren't in order of importance, by the way. It's just the way they came out. Three, question everything. Four, get involved. This is huge, right? Building community means showing up. Five, say, what next? As opposed to, why me? And finally, embrace it. Uncertainty, beautiful uncertainty, because there's a ton of creativity that can be found in that moment. So let's look at the first one, reduce debt reliance on things. So that's things, not people. I want us to rely on each other, but I want us to start trying to think about our events, whatever it is we're doing, and perhaps work out, are there key things that will make this event happen? A PowerPoint, power, food, and put that as a list. And then work out what happens if I take one of those things away. Can my event still survive? And so it's basically business continuity, disaster recovery under another name, right? How can I exist? How can my event exist or the work that I exist? How can that still happen under those circumstances? Now, Amy and I had a bit of a shock uh, a couple of weeks ago. I was called for jury service and um, I couldn't defer it because I, I had previously deferred it. So I wrote to them and said, I've got this really important day. And they said, congratulations, you're still coming in. Um, and I was supposed to come in last Monday. Now, those of you who've done jury service before will know that if you don't get called, you then are on retainer for two months. And I had this horror that I was gonna be in Vermont and get the call the night before saying, you've, you've got to serve the next day. And I thought a lot about what to do because you know, I know there's a lot on a plate when someone is organizing an event like this. I didn't wanna give Amy any stress. But I also knew that by telling Amy there was a chance I might not make it with a couple of weeks notice, Amy might be able to find someone as a standby. So I was trying to help Amy reduce the debt reliance on having me as a keynote speaker. I'm thrilled that that didn't have to happen. I really wanted to be here today, thank you. But it was a good example. Um, so also, if you're gonna give a speech like this, I practiced without notes, I practiced without PowerPoint, I practiced without a microphone. Just reducing the debt reliance on things. Is there any way your event can survive? Now, the headline that you see on this slide, the pandemic nearly killed theater, the creative way it fought back could leave it stronger, 
question mark, was from the United Kingdom. But it was something that some people working in the events and performing arts industry did find as a result of the pandemic. The pandemic was not good. Uh, you know, I lost people myself, it was a horrendous time. But we found ways forward that we wouldn't have found if there hadn't have been a pandemic. And as a result, we should lean on those new ways. So I now collaborate with artists I couldn't have collaborated with before because we've learned how to use Zoom. You remember the first Zoom meetings, how awful they were? And they're still not good, right? But finding the mute button, not having your camera turning on, working out which camera it was, you know, and also I would argue, we learned to be more human. I love seeing people's pets. I loved it when children ran in and wanted to give their parents a hug because they'd come home from school. And we got to be a little bit more human with each other. And I think that was really important. So in reducing our debt reliance on having to behave in a certain way and doing things a certain way, we managed to find a way forward. So we've reduced our debt reliance. What about building community? Well, it was, this is interesting. This is where the corporate world can sometimes inform our practice. I love the corporate world. They have the money to come up with the ideas that I then steal. So, so there was the firm that we all know, DuPont, and they couldn't work out why they were still getting so many accidents when they were throwing tons of money at accident and incident reduction. And so doing what corporate world might occasionally do, they got a lot of people in a room and said, fix it, you have one afternoon to solve this problem. Now, what came out of that was the DuPont-Bradley curve, as invented by one of the members of staff, Berlin Bradley, who I hope is a millionaire by now, but I'm sure isn't because he was doing it on his work time. What Bradley noticed was that every time there was an event, DuPont threw money at the situation, but they didn't take a step back and work out how did we get there in the first place? So they were incredibly reactive, right? So, you know, let's imagine I'm on stage and I'm doing a fit up and something falls on my head and someone says, oh, we better get Anna a hard hat. And I put the hard hat on my head, I continue my work and then the next day I come in and there's no hard hats available so I just go back to doing what I was doing. We haven't really done a lot of accident protect protection and I were being very, very reactive. What Bradley said was, if we add in some rules and supervision, we start to lower the chances that that will happen again. So we have a stage supervisor maybe, or someone who says, we're gonna put a poster up on the wall that said, during a fit up, please put a hard hat on or, or wear your steel toes or we don't want any members of the public coming in. Well, that works unless people can't speak the language of the poster that you have up or the supervisor goes on a toilet break. That's the one time that someone will definitely walk past them, right? I remember walking into the Tower of London years ago to, to have a look at an exhibition of diamonds and they were beautiful and I took my phone out and took a picture and I was swarmed on by three beef eaters who yelled at me and said, didn't you see the sign on the way in that said no photos? I didn't because there was a hundred people queuing in front of it. And I'm, I'm, trust me, I'm a rule follower most of the time. So they don't always see the sign. So rules and supervision will only get you so far. Then you've got the independent work, right? So if you keep doing that work of telling people, you know, this is what we want you to do, and we have posters up, and we reward good behavior, people start to do it themselves. I am going to put on a hard hat when I do this particular type of work. Now, if you keep on that road, eventually you might get to the state that we want to get to, which is the interdependent, when we're helping each other, when you don't need a supervisor, but someone working with you will tell you how things go. Culture is simply the way we do things around here. It isn't what we say we do, it's what we actually do. And you know, I loved walking in here today. I was greeted by people. I've given, you know, told where the food is, told where the bathrooms are, someone's told me where the exits are. All of that is all part of culture. But if I didn't do any of that and then someone stood up here and said, we believe that we should keep you all safe, then that's very, very different. So we're trying to get to this stage for this interdependent place. And the way we do that is we build community. Now this is put another way, but essentially quite a lot of people needed when you're gonna instinctively respond to people. When you start to go down the supervision, you need to employ more and more people. But if people are independently trying to make things safe, you need less. And then you can actually bring more people on slowly and your onboarding is better when you have the interdependent motion. Most arts organizations run hot. We have little money 
and we don't have a lot of time and people to do all of the things that we want to do. So being interdependent, helping people to help each other is the best way that we can build safety into our community. And the best events have happened because of that. So now we've reduced our debt leverage, we've built our community, now we can start to question everything. Maybe you've been handed an event that has been done a certain way forever and you'd like to change it, but that's the way it's always been done. Well, now is the time to question everything. Why do we do it this way? Years ago, I was working at the National Theatre and I was in charge of all of the fire systems all around the building. And there was in the basement car park a fire hose that was the bane of my life because it cost a lot of money to maintain every year and I knew the fire department didn't ever use it because they always brought their own hoses because they doubted that a hose left in a building would be fit for purpose. But if you have something for fire, you should maintain it. So I asked the question, why are we maintaining this fire hose? And the answer I got was, the general manager likes to wash his car with it. Well, I went to the general manager and I said, is it true? Because nobody wanted to talk to the general manager because he was actually quite scary, but I was new and I didn't know that. Is it true that you wash your car with it? No, I've never washed my car with that hose. So we got rid of us. We got rid of it and saved like 500 pounds for the year. Question everything, because you never know what it is that someone has decided is a thing that doesn't need to be a thing anymore. Plus, it's time for a change, I think. So if you don't know how to question something, a simple thing is, what if we did the exact opposite? Would that be as safe? Would that be as cheap? Could it be better? It might be not. I mean, obviously, there are some things we must do for safety. We can't block fire exits. But it's a good opportunity to have a look at that. And the funny thing is, we're not the only animals that question everything. So there's this beautiful piece of writing by Helen MacDonald. Um, she was the person who wrote H is for Hawk. And she did this whole book on nature writing. But this article, which, which was printed in the New York Times, and I will give you the link to this, really resonated with me. So for years, people were studying the flight of swifts. And they studied what they called the swifts' vesper flights. And that's when the swifts go up thousands of feet into the air. And people thought they were sleeping. In fact, there have been records of pilots in the, in the wars before when they were flying open planes as opposed to the ones we've got now, reaching out and pulling a swift from the sky, thinking that swift was still asleep. It's very romantic. But then they started to actually do a little bit more research and, and modern day technology getting up closer to them and actually filming what was going on. And they realized they weren't asleep. And they also flew not only at nighttime in what they called the Vesper flights, but in the dawn time as well. In fact, just when the light was about the same, morning and night at that crossover period, they would get up really high. What they are doing is questioning everything. They are getting up high enough so that they can see weather events coming. And they can also feel the wind to know if, how likely it is that weather event, if they don't have Google app or, or iPhone app or weather bug or whatever it is we're using. They're getting up there and they're sensing the weather because it matters to them. Can they eat? Can they fly? And they're getting high enough up to see the terrain so that they are, they are basically doing the helicopter view. It's like brilliant what they do. So to question everything, I urge you to take a Vespa flight. Imagine your event far away. I mean, that's what COVID forced us to do, right? We stopped having to look at just what was happening at our event and we realized the connectivity we all had to each other. That if someone is gonna travel, they might bring something to me. Or if I'm gonna go somewhere, I might bring something. So I better wear a mask, I better get tested because I'm realizing how I'm connected. Or what happens if I need to give a resource to somebody? You know, we started in a neighborhood text chain to find out who needed toilet roll, right? I never would have thought of doing that, but it's that Vespa flight of realizing that we're part of something bigger. And when we're making those decisions, I'm borrowing again from some course material of one of the courses that Tiger Cook with, took with me, which we did behavioral safety and decision quality. When we're making those decisions, starting from a decision that is rooted in our safety and our practice is really important. So if you have a decision to make, if, you've, if you're starting to question everything and you wanna make a decision that's new, start with who you are. What is your clarity of objectives, right? Is it rooted in your purpose and your values, the decision that you are about to make? And if you're thinking, I don't know if I have purpose and values, it's a great exercise to have a personal, your own personal values to start with. 
And then is it framed well? Am I giving this decision the time it needs? Right? Sometimes in events, especially in emergency, we don't have a lot of time. I, I get that. So when I don't have a lot of time, I try to bring people with me that I can rely on in those moments to help me. It's got to have a clear purpose, right? We're trying to make this decision with a very, very clear outcome. And it has a well-defined scope. When I'm talking to my students about their thesis project, they want to change the world. And what I challenge them to do is change it by 1%, because that is really hard. And keeping your scope of a decision small is actually really challenging. Then work out what are your here be dragon moments. What are the things that you cannot possibly know as part of your decision? And make sure with a Vespa flight that you really can't know it, or is it just that you don't know it, but somebody else might? Have you considered all the options and alternatives? What if anything was possible? You know, we're learning that as we invite more people to the table, the table should change, right? We don't invite more people to the table for it to stay the same, and that's what I love. So all of the alternatives. Does it take into consideration our human biases and our cognitive failures? Just because I've built this table, even though it came from Ikea, I still feel like I've built it, doesn't mean it's the world's best table, right? We might want to get another table. Or what about that sunk cost fallacy? We've put so much energy and time into this already, we better keep going. Actually, maybe now's the time to stop. Or we've never done it before. That's not what we do here. Or maybe it's time to start. And finally, once you've made your decision, it's smooth from making the decision into the action. So we would have decisions during COVID time, for example, that we were going to ask our audiences to wear masks. And the first time somebody refused was when the decision was questioned. So then you go back and you say, what is our purpose? Well, the highest law, said Cicero, is the safety of the people. And I want to make sure everyone in this room is safe. So yes, we're going to wear masks. Is it, does it confirm our values? Yes, it does. We're not excluding, we're offering here's a chance. And we work through it. So we know that it's exactly the right thing to do. But trust me, you'll make a decision and then when, when it gets hard, that's when people will start to question it. And if you've done this thinking, it will help you each time. So let's get involved is the next thing. Now, sorry, this, is, this might feel a bit UK-centric, but there's been some brilliant examples for me to use from the UK, so I'm, I'm pulling them. But recently, there was a terrible event in the United Kingdom when there was a yoga class that was attacked by somebody and some people tragically lost their lives. And as a result, I'm ashamed to say that some far right members of the UK took to the streets and caused huge amounts of violence. They trashed libraries, which for me is unforgivable. They trashed temples and they made people feel ashamed and scared. It was awful. And on one particular night, they were planning a night of rioting and violence. So about six days after. On that night, this is what happened. The people of Britain took to the streets and said, not in our town and not on my watch. And they held signs saying, you are welcome here. And they held signs saying, this isn't us. And thousands and thousands of people showed up. Now, it wasn't just one or two. Everyone said, we are going to do a counter protest. And I felt you know, really emotional about this because it proved that we weren't a country that was heading into this territory of far right nationalism, but we were a country that wanted to make people feel better. And we were going to show the other side but it only worked because everyone showed up. You know, I had friends messaging me saying they were going out. I saw the images. I wish this happened all the time, right? It shouldn't just be a one-off thing. Everyone should always feel welcome. But this is what happens when people get involved. I know in smaller areas, it's harder to gather a crowd together. But days like today, when we learn to network, mean that we can pull more resources in to get involved. And although I don't live in Vermont, I hope you know that I now hope to be part of this community. And I am also a resource. And I love these conversations. So get involved as much as you can. Perhaps offer, if you know an event is happening and you think they're having some struggles, can I help? Can I just show up today just to support you? Now we say, what's next as opposed to why me? I will say, sometimes you have to start with a bit of why me, right? It's OK. It's natural to say, really? After all that I've done, after all that I've organized, Anna might not be able to come because they've got jury service, really? But the reason that we need to reframe what we say is because 
it's incredibly powerful. They did studies of veterans coming back from terrible situations overseas who were trying to work their way through what had happened. And they found that actually by asking them to say what is going to happen next is very, very powerful. It just changes the conversation. So instead of when, when things really go wrong, you know, we say, okay, what are we going to do next? So in the Battersea Arts Centre, which was a small local art centre in the United Kingdom, they had managed to raise enough money to finally do a little bit of work they needed in their Great Hall. It had taken them years and years and years to raise this money. And within a couple of weeks of the work starting, a workman flicked a cigarette away into the corner of the building and the whole building caught fire. It was terrible. Now, what Battersea did was two things. First, it got ahead of the message. And if I can give anyone a quick handy tip, if you have any form of social media and any event goes wrong, if you can be the first people to talk about it, tell it all, tell it true, tell it fast, you will get ahead of the message because people started to come to Battersea tweets for the actual information. And so they were able to control what was going on. So here we go. There's a fire in our building. Everyone has got out and the fire brigade are working to keep it under control, we'll, we'll keep you posted. And then the second tweet was, we can't do performances, we know we're gonna have to send you back your money, but bear with us. Well, you can imagine, to a person, everyone donated that ticket back into the building. In fact, it started a GoFundMe, which ended up raising millions for a restoration. But I was lucky enough to be working with Battersea at the time, and they called me in, and the production manager said to me, what's next? So we said, what do you need to make your events keep going? They didn't need a roof over their head. They just needed their people, which they had. So arts organizations around London said, why don't you use our venue? Why don't you use our venue? And the Phoenix season was born. Lovely name, really clever thinking. And they started to tour London just to keep the name of the Battersea Arts Center alive until they'd raised enough money. And finally, they rebuilt the hall under the um, Back From Disaster show event. Really spectacular work. But crucially, in that moment, when everyone was tired because they were sick of fundraising, saying, what's next for us, as opposed to why us, really, really helped them reframe. But how do you get yourself into that frame of mind? Well, I borrowed this. Again, I'm always rip off and duplicate. That's the way to go forward from the forces, and it really works. And it actually is something I use in these moments. Sergeant Major eats sugar cookies. Sergeant, situation. What's the problem? Our building is on fire. Mission, what's our strategy for solving it? Well, we with the fire brigade are dealing with the fire, but we need to keep this theatre company alive. That's what we're gonna do, okay. What tactics are we going to use? Well, we're going to start moving our venues around so that we can keep our shows going. So that's our execution. Service and support. What are we going to need for that exactly? Well, we're going to need a venue of this size. We're going to need dressing rooms. We're going to, you get the idea. How many people were we going to need? And finally, command and control. Who else needs to help me communicate about this? So I literally always say this to myself, Sergeant Major Eat Sugar Cookies, because one of the key issues I found in disasters is that people don't fully frame the situation and they don't fully frame the mission. There are things that someone else will be taking care of for you and you need to work out what are your priorities after life safety to, to move forward. And once you frame those two things, the rest of it will start to fall into place and then you know who you can ask for. Who is in your community? Who will get involved in that moment? Finally, uncertainty, beautiful uncertainty. I come back to the thing that I, that I kind of really started with. Yes, our bodies go through stress when we're uncertain. Our blood pressure rises, our heart beats, we start to sweat. But then something amazing happens in our brains. Our brains, start to figure out that we're about to learn something. Neurons start firing and the architecture in our brains reframes to get ready to learn something new. And in that moment, scientists have found that we become our most creative. And you can actually train yourself to kind of work in these situations, right? Try answering the phone when you don't recognize the number. That's a tiny piece of uncertainty. I hate doing it, it's always a spam call, but if you, if you do that, it trains your brain 
to do something to do with uncertainty. Or try and find your way around without using Google or answer a question. You know, a couple of years ago, I learned about a figure who I'd never heard of before, and I decided I wasn't going to Google who that figure was. I was going to ask people if they knew who that figure was, and it turned out this figure was a travel writer, and people gave me books about this writer. It was a wonderful journey, which I would never have gone on if I had just Googled the name Patrick Lee Verma. So try some uncertainty, and try to see if it will work, and just build up, because what happens is we then get to a state of anti-fragility, which is the step beyond resilience. Resilience really is us not changing. We're trying to stay who we are in the face of something going wrong. But actually, sometimes we might need to change. We might need to grow. And this anti-fragile was a term coined by the uh, great writer Nassim Taleb. I, I urge you to read his book, The Black Swan. It's really good. And what he said is, Sometimes this randomness, this disorder, can help us grow in ways that we never thought possible. And I would say, never in my wildest dreams did I imagine that I'd be lucky enough to stand in front of all of you today in Vermont, which I would never have done if I hadn't accepted a ton of uncertainty way back in 2016 when all my stuff was being carted across the Atlantic. So in summary, we need to reduce our debt reliance on things. We need to build our community, which is exactly what we're doing today. Question everything, but try to remember to hold true to your clarity and your objectives. Get involved. Say, what's next, as opposed to why me, or maybe why me first. And then embrace it, beautiful uncertainty, and be agile enough in those moments to spot the opportunities. And if you want to know more about the person that came up with this original lift, Ben, ben Catanio, uh, the Decision Studio Making podcast, um, good friend of mine, he and I have talked together, and I, he's, a, he's, a great, he's a great thinker. So finally, remember, if you want to go fast, go alone. But to go far, go together. Thank you very much. Amy, I don't know, we have a few minutes for Q&A, or does everyone want to? Sign of a good talk when everyone is speechless. <laughs> I'm curious if anyone has tried any of the things that I've mentioned today, and if it's worked for any of you. Yeah, I liked what you talked about. I'm from the Vermont Studio Center. My name's Koi. And um, we were impacted by the 2023 flood. And we communicated fast. We communicated everything. And at the time, I was in development. I was the person helping all of that communication. I was like, are we sure? But it worked in our favor, because our community came out, helped us muck gave us money, did all the things that we needed. Um, so it, it, that worked. <laughs> tell everything and tell it fast. And I bet there was a point of view, part of you that wanted to, to cover it up a little bit and say, we've got this under control, but how wonderful that in that moment you could be vulnerable and your community stepped up for you. Uh. First, and I just want to say thank you um, and really appreciate, I think, what you have offered and really taught us. And again, in the spirit of Nifa being here as a learner, uh, for me, this seems like, um, you know, I'm coming to like grow my competencies and all of those kind of things. And in um, the profession of teaching, you have these alternative certifications you have to do, right? And so if I reposition myself, it's like this is not an alternative certification, what can I apply to it now? I'm the executive director, right? So I'm supposed to think of all of these things. What's often in front of mind, and when I started thinking about this in the, the framework of funding, 
everything made sense, right? Because I'm chasing funding, funding is uncertain, all of these kind of things. And I'm in just that change of mind for me because I don't manage to build in them facilities, but I manage um, how viable we will be um, with all of our resources, including funding. And we have a current situation now that I'm just like, oh, had I, we lost major, like, you know, so I could track it based on what I'm currently doing. So I'm just wondering, there may be others, you know, I don't produce events, I produce the safety of the organization and funding is like so important. So I'm just thinking about, is there a response to that? Have you been able to like transfer uh, some of the information that you've shared um, given all of the different things we hold and particularly we hold funding very, very sacred um, in our work? Transferring as into a skill set or as in right. a yeah. So I mean, <clears throat> you know, the 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 world of safety is full of qualifications, right? Mm -hmm. So there's the in in, the, in this country there's the this certified safety practitioner, there's the OSHA ten, and I think they're all very very valuable. Um, but what I found was that we have that within us most of the time, that which we already need. Um, we're just learning to how to communicate that. And so I actually started to look at the world of risk management and finance because I was often talking to people above me and trying to get them involved and excited about safety. And I wasn't getting there when I was talking, you know, they just want me to fix the trip hazard. They don't want me to fix the fact that their staff are exhausted or there isn't enough funding for, for me to do what I do. So I actually use a lot of the framework of risk management and I start talking about, you know, um, in terms of the horizon scanning to an organization and I lift their eyes up. I do that Vespa flight with them and I say, what's coming to you and, and how are you responding in that way? And so <clears throat> I wouldn't necessarily say, you know, um, uh, qualifications, but I, I actually lean on the World Economic uh, Organization's um, Global Risk Register, and you can start to, to sit, it takes people out of the, it's just you asking for this, as to there's a wider community asking for this, right? So if you look at the, the risks for the next 10 years, right up there is climate change climate climate you know any any kind of weather event and so if you're an organization that is having and i know i'm definitely speaking to people whose lives have been devastated by floods right that is the key thing to work on um which change reframes it as like oh you just want more money to to build another bit of the library or something it's like we're trying to we're trying to save a community here and we can and i'm telling you that the rest of the world can see this coming mental health right we used to shout physical safety and whisper mental health, and that's not happening anymore, not at least in the classes I teach or in the worlds I'm inhabiting. And it, even um, we were, my wife and I were watching Slow Horses the other day on television, and in the credits, underneath safety, there was a mental health expert. And I was like, finally, this is good. So I, I would offer, I'm not sure if this is getting exactly at what you want, Harold, but I think it's framing that conversation around risk management for the people who are just thinking about money and, and, and sort of talking about like safety as a currency, but not just safety about risk as a currency might help change that conversation. Yeah, thank you. Maybe one last question. I'm Rose Friedman from the Civic Standard. And I am wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, discomfort versus safety. I think the anti-fragility slide was really um, touching on a lot of things that we see in our work of getting people into a shared space who wouldn't otherwise be comfortable with each other. Um, and I think that there's a lot of unknowns, not just in weather and the event planned, but in who comes and how they interact with each other. And there's so much we can't control in that. And I think there's a lot of confusion between those two two things, safety and discomfort. Yeah, what a great question, Rose. Thank you so much. So um, when you undertake running a marathon, there's going to be a lot of discomfort in that be because you're going to be sweating and you're going to be tired, And but there is an outcome. And you have the ability to stop at any time and quit and move aside and rest. So when I'm inviting people into a space, which we're going to have a challenging conversation, which I hope they'll do, then I would ask them to lean into that discomfort, knowing that they remain in control of that discomfort. I hope they don't walk away from the table, but at any time they can. Now the difference is, is if someone walks into a space and I apply the discomfort and they can't walk away from it, which for too long, you know, when I stand up here, 
I stand with a huge amount of privilege. You know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a white person. I am non-binary, so I do struggle in some spaces. Um, but I, I've had the privilege of, of, a, of a great education. And so I often am the person setting the agenda in a room. And I've learned that if you're the person setting the agenda and you think it's not happening fast enough, then probably you need to stop and ask everyone in the room, are they okay? So some key things is we now, um, in, you know, in meetings and everything, make sure we take a moment to have people identify themselves in the space. So we can acknowledge when there is a discrepancy. Um, we can acknowledge that people can, can speak their pronouns into a space, which can be very important, and ask them if anyone has any accessibility needs. But then we're going to get to a conversation, and at some point in that conversation, people are going to start feeling uncomfortable because we're going to be challenging things that people have held for a long time, or we're going to do an event in a slightly different way. But what I would offer is to say to people, you can also choose to step out, but if we don't have those conversations, we're damaging people who can't choose to step out, who, can't, who just, you know, we've, we've learned a lot about how people show up to rehearsal rooms, right? Not everyone walks into a rehearsal room having had the same experience. Maybe you've just been followed around a shop and someone thought you were a thief, or maybe you were yelled at on the street, and then I'm gonna ask you to come in and change who you are before you've even accepted what's just happened to you, where someone else has had a fine old time, has walked in, bought a coffee, and they're having a different experience. So I think, we, you know, this is a, a long conversation. I think it's definitely worth getting into. You've raised a really key point, but people are going to feel discomfort, but they shouldn't feel unsafe, and they should be able to step away from that discomfort as if they were running a marathon, um, not being having that forced onto them and feeling that they couldn't at any point get out of that. So that's a very quick answer to something that needs much more in depth. And I'm probably speaking to a room full of people who would gladly lean into a conversation. It's much harder to bring someone in who, who doesn't. Um, I like to start by asking curious why questions. Tell me why, where, you know, tell me a little bit more about what you think. Um, you know, tell me a little bit more about, you know, how you, what, how you arrived at those decisions. Um, sometimes I have conversations that start with how the artist wants to look. You know, and and you know, th then I'll say, well, you know, well, how how you know, how would you like to appear in this space? And then when someone says, I want them to look like this, we can challenge that. Actually, maybe we want to invite the artist to say how they want to appear in this space, and let's start having those conversations. But really hard, and I'm gl I'm glad you brought it up. Cool. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Anna. I just have a little, uh, my name is Patty Regan. I'm part of the Backdarn Steering Committee. I just have some housekeeping to do before we move on to our next portion of the day. Uh, can we hear it one more time for Anna Glover? They were so great. Thank you. Um, okay, so we're gonna move into our first session of breakouts. In your program, you'll see a full description and location for each event. Uh, the options are the role of arts and culture in Barry's Recovery and Resilience, which is at the Aldrich Library, which is right across the street. Um, quick update to the program, Pam Wilson's affiliation should be listed as resident artist at SPA, Barry Up, and Imagine Barry. Um, events in the face of climate change will be right here in this room, so you can stay right here. And the flood of July 2023 at the Moral Homestead will be over at Vermont History Center. Um, it's a two-tenths of a mile uphill on Washington Street. Um, the information desk, if you have any questions throughout the day, uh, will be staffed and you can get directions, uh, information about everything that's happening today. There's also uh, a resource table over there uh, in the corner underneath that TV. There's TVs in every corner, so that doesn't actually help, um, but it's that corner. Um, uh, an update about the Vermont History Center, the elevator providing access to the main floor of uh, the History Center has been intermittently non-functional. There's no other way to gain access to the building except stairs. Um, it's unusual and there's been outage periods. If you need um, accessibility to that building, let us know and we'll uh, figure something out. I think that's, our, that's where we're at right now. It's uncertain. I guess, um, but we'll, uh, we'll work with you on that. Uh, there is a quiet room available all day at the Aldridge Library if you need a break from this rowdy bunch. Um, it's on the second floor of the conference room. It's a quiet space. Uh, you can hang out there and um, sort of be by yourself or be alone with others. Um, the restrooms in the building here 
Uh, there's a single-use restroom that is on this floor back by uh, just beyond the registration desk. There are also two larger uh, bathrooms downstairs. Uh, there's a elevator over on this side uh, to get downstairs if you need to get down there. Um, let's see, on-site tours and talks, there are five opportunities for on-site tours and talks this afternoon. Uh, there's sign-up sheets because there are a limited number of um, participants for each tour, so you can sign up at the registration desk. And um, the let's see, in the program there's some other cultural opportunities that are um, in Berlin. Uh, I encourage you to just explore Barrie. It's a really uh, cool city, and uh, I don't think we, we're really happy to be hosting this event here. So, um, yeah, if you need, if you have any questions, registration table, uh, anyone on the steering committee can help. And uh, we'll just take about 15 minutes before this presentation starts and all the other ones. So uh, I hope you enjoy your day, and thanks for being here.